But I, I don't think it was a revival necessarily, and I don't think Asbury ever called it revival. I think they were actually very careful not to call it revival. And um, what it was was hunger. It was mm. hunger. It mm. was hunger. And uh, I, we, this, uh, our conversation's not about Asbury, but I was there through the night on, uh, on this particular night that I was there. And I, the things I will remember about Asbury were somewhere around, I don't know, I can't remember the time. Let's just say it was 12.45 a.m. Uh, grandma and granddad coming in. 80, both of them. Hmm. Uh, he had a cane. Uh, she's in, on his arm. And they're just shuffling down the aisle to about 10 rows down, take their seats. They stay, I don't know, I don't watch them that carefully. They probably stay an hour and I leaned over to a friend of mine and I said, I've lived a long time and I've seen a lot of things happen in church before, in the church building before. I've never seen a senior adult couple shuffle into church at 12.45 a.m. on a weeknight. <laughs> never one time. Uh, an hour later, a dad came in with his 11 and 9-year-old sons. And they found their way down a few rows in front of the older couple and they sat down. And I said, well, you can mark that down as well. I'm 65 years old. I've been around church all my life. I have never seen on a school night a dad come into church at 1.30 in the morning with two elementary school age kids. Mm. They were hungry. They came. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. That way you'll never miss a thing. Pastors, I know how hard it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, and especially you're preaching week after week. So maybe you hit a writer's block or it's Friday and you haven't really finished things up. I wanna help. So I've got a 10 step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I simplified the whole prep process into a series of steps and reminders that can help you ensure your sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So visit preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description and you'll get a copy sent to you for free today. This episode is also presented by 10 by 10. Did you know that approximately 1 million young people in America drift from their faith every year? And this means that by 2034, 10 million young people will walk away from their faith and miss out on experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised. Well, imagine if we could do something to reverse this. That's why 10 by 10 was born, a national initiative created to help make faith matter more to 10 million young people over the next 10 years. Together, we can turn the tide of young people walking away from their faith. So the question is, will you answer the call to help 10 by 10 advocate for the faith of the next generation? You can go to 1010.org to learn more. That's 1010.org to learn more. And now to today's episode. Louis, it's so good to have you back. Welcome back. Thanks, Carrie. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. So what are some significant changes you've seen in church leadership and ministry, um, either that you're watching or that you're noticing right now? I mean, I think we'd all agree we're in a period of some pretty rapid change. What are you seeing, Louis? Well, I think the thing, Carrie, that I'm uh, dealing with the most as a leader, and we've just gotten this actually confirmed with some data recently at Passion City Church, is that church is beginning again. And I think mm. the mindset coming out of the last few years was getting back to normal or when things return to normal or we get back to where we were. And we try not to use any of that mentality early on because I think the world got shaken up in such a degree in the last few years that getting back to anything wasn't going to happen. That was yeah. seemed pretty obvious to me, that, that getting back is not a worthy goal. So it's really assessing what is, and that's what leadership has been since March of 2020, what is today. Mm -hmm. And I, we may have talked about this in a earlier podcast, but even our meetings got shorter and shorter and shorter in 2020 because we would have an hour-long meeting about option A, B, C, or D, 
the meeting would end and someone would get a notification on their phone and then everything we had just talked about for one solid hour had become moot. And it yep. was like, okay, there is no A, B, C, or D. Those are all gone as of the last 15 minutes. A decision was made, a, you know, whatever, whatever. So the meetings got shorter. Let's meet for five minutes. <laughs> Let's think about what we're doing in the next few hours. And so what kind of leadership is that? It's really more assessing what is versus forecasting what's going to be or protecting or preserving what has been. And I think that's, uh, from a leadership standpoint, that's the lens that I'm looking through. And what I'm seeing is a total reshuffle of the deck. Um, a lot of new faces, and a lot of new people coming to church, a lot of people putting their faith in Jesus, a lot of people getting baptized. Hmm. And uh, we took a survey and got uh, a very good sample, 5,000 results, and uh, they told us, <laughs> this is crazy, uh, 25% of them have been coming to our church for less than one year. So wow. one in four people that are at a gathering or in some area of ministry at Passion City, uh, 10, uh, 15% of them less than six months and 25% of them less than a year. So it's a reintroduction. Um, it's welcoming people into the community of faith. It's welcoming people into what corporate worship is about. It's welcoming people mm -hmm. into the process of discipleship and, of course, culture and norms for our particular family. And I'm really encouraged by all of that. And I'm not trying to put a spin on anything. I just know that for us, the main metric right now is new, new people who, for whatever reason, in the last uh, period of time, have decided they want to be in church. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think you're alone in that. Almost everybody I talk to says that this is not the church they were leading four years ago, three years ago. Definitely not. And uh, <laughs> pardon me, it's not necessarily a bad thing that there's new people in the house. Um, I imagine, you know, Passion goes back to the late 90s. Passion City Church is how old now? We're a dozen years old it. now, still a relatively young church. Yeah. But I imagine you're no stranger to reinventing yourself. You know, if you look at Passion as it was when it launched and Passion as it is today, it's recognizable, but not the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the non-negotiable of Jesus first, you know, we're a very Jesus first church. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the language we use, actually. We are a Jesus church. And, you know, as a pastor, people are always going to ask you because they don't know what else to ask you when they meet you and you say, well, I'm a pastor. Well, question number one, what kind of church is your church? And I've always just been happy to say we're a Jesus church. And that's still very much true and not up for negotiation, obviously, but the ebb and flows of life and of church. And we were, before COVID, we were one and a half churches. Um, really, we had a DC location that was going strong, but in Atlanta, we were here at our main location and we were meeting in a high school. And here we are just a few years on the other side of that, and we have three locations in Atlanta. We're no longer in a high school with that locations in a full location. Um, and that's crazy that we went in <laughs> one and a half uh, locations on a Sunday in Atlanta, and we have three booming locations in Atlanta now. That's a lot of new um, dynamics that come with that on just about every level. What did you have to reinvent? Like, it's new people, but I think you're right. The world that we know new doesn't exist anymore. So what feels new or is new to you as you look ahead? Well, that's a great question. And I, I'm not sure that I really have a, I'm ready to package this answer for it yet, Carrie. I think new for me is uh, shorter mm -hmm. timelines. So James is now way more relevant. I've always thought, obviously, James is relevant. It's the living, breathing Word of God, talking about the letter of James. But that section where he says, you know, don't, don't get too far ahead of yourself. Don't, don't overconfidently, you know, telegraph your plans. On this, uh, so this day, we're going to go to this city, and we're going to do this kind of thing. And uh, what you should say, yeah. he says, is, if the Lord wills. So... To, to, as a leader, I think 
part of the new is let's get more in the present and let's follow the Holy Spirit more in short-term increments with confidence that those are going to lead us to long-term results. I'm pretty bullish on on the timeline. I, and I say that humbly. I, Jesus could come while we're in the middle of this conversation. But I, I think we're going to be around a while. And so I think yeah. leaders should not buy into the panic eject button mentality. Hey, this is the end time, so we don't need to worry about things. I think we should be looking 5, 10, 20, 100 years down the line. But I think we should be doing it in very renewable increments of today and with a mindset of today. And I think that just it changes the way you you approach people. You're not looking at them as some kind of long-term project. You're really engaging them right here in the moment. How can I serve you? How can I lead you? How can I encourage you? How can I pray for you? What is God doing in you right now in trying to be more present in the shorter increments of life? Hmm. Few people have been in ministry as long as you have and yet have an incredible connection with the next generation. So Gen Z is emerging. Uh, They're not new, but they're really moving into adulthood now. And as you work with college students, you have a younger church as well at Passion City. What are you seeing? What are the trends, the qualities, and the characteristics of Gen Z that you're seeing, um, both positive and negative? There's a lot of positive, but you know, a lot of people are thinking, how do we reach Gen Z? What does that look like? What should I expect as they arrive at my church or in, you know, as we serve them in our organization or business? What are you seeing in Gen Z? Well, you know, Carrie, that is a, a minefield of a question for me. And I, I do, I understand yeah. the question fully. But I think Gen Z is in the some ways the same as their uh, predecessors. Uh, they don't like to be prepackaged and understood. And so yep. I'm trying to do less of less evaluation of them and more just be encouraged by them. Some of my personal <laughs> observations is that uh, they they want to go for the gusto. They are a I'm ready to jump in and be all in generation. And I like that. I very much respect that about young people that I'm around right now. And whether, you know, they want to carry that moniker of Gen Z or not, it's just more of a uh, like light little reference points that they're more interested in home ownership than either of the two groups that have preceded them at the age that they're at right now. They don't want to rent. They don't want to give someone their money for a long term. They're making plans right now. I want my own home. Well, that's new, and I think it's a good signal that they're they're here to stay. They want to invest in things. They want to be bought into things. They want ownership of things, whether that's generational change, uh, awakening, spiritual awakening, or uh, starting a business or businesses, in their case, um, they're phenomenal multitaskers, I'll tell you that. And uh, they can be having an enjoying lunch and running two businesses at the same time. So I'm encouraged overall. I, I don't feel, I feel like the cynicism is waning. I don't have any data to prove that, Carrie, but I feel like they want to believe that they're, they see the glass half full and they're ready to go right now. And maybe if there's one caution, it would be that there's a multi generational strength that we see even in the announcement of Jesus, that you've got Mary, this young girl, and you've got um, Elizabeth, this older woman, all in the same story. So the angel is crossing generations so that there's an older woman and a younger woman in the same you know, moment in time. And I think that that's uh, probably my best encouragement to, to this generation right now is make sure you've got those older voices, not just in your life, but that you're actually listening to the older voices in your life. Well, you're not alone in saying, I don't know, you know, generational, <laughs> that's that's one thing. And to just say, well, this is a Gen Z attitude or millennial attitude. Uh, I'll have to do my homework, but it was either, I think it was Pew Research, Pew or Gallup came out with a long piece that recently said, you know what, 
we want to be a little more careful about how we characterize Gen Z because some of that is life stage, right? Like right. millennials were never going to own homes and now they're all pushing 40, uh, the older ones. And they're like, yeah, they're looking an awful lot like boomers did when they were in their 30s. So <laughs> I think you do have to be careful with labels. Uh, so noted and shared. But you do have in an unprecedented way or, or you have very few peers in um, your ability to work with young adults and you've done that for generations, for, for years, for decades, I should say. And um, you have the ear and the heart of them. So if you wouldn't mind drilling down a little bit more, uh, I would love to know, we have a lot of preachers, a lot of communicators, people trying to connect with the next generation. Are there, and again, you're a Jesus first church, etc. but you've been um, preaching to young adults for, for decades. Are there any changes you're noticing in how they're hearing, what they want to hear, um, how you're delivering the message that are particular to the next generation? Well, that's such a, a great question. And I think, um, you know, I think the things that have been in our favor hmm. is our A, that we've actually acknowledged the generation. And I think hmm. this is uh, step one. So A, do you see them? And step two would be, uh, do you value them? And when you, as you advance in your arc of life, you tend to be threatened by the the, the lower arc of life that you don't understand, mm. that yep. maybe you don't know what their language means. Um, you're not sure how they're thinking. Maybe they're they're coming across to you as critical or skeptical. Or, um, or however they're coming across to you, and it causes you to feel like you're on your heels. And so typically, a human being in that situation would choose uh, either avoidance mm. or antagonism. I'm going to attack mm. them and all of their problems, and that's how I'm going to feel more confident, or I'm just going to avoid them altogether and stick around with people my own age. And we've chosen not to do either of those things. We've chosen to see the next generation as valuable and to try to find ways to serve them. Because, Carrie, they, um, I've said this many times, but we, we started a Bible study on a college campus years ago, decades ago. And one of the first places we ended up meeting was in a church building that literally, not figuratively, literally was across the street from the religion department at this school and the, and the, the campus. So you cross the street, big church, and we asked, we went to meet with the team there to see if we could use their church on Monday night. And uh, someone on their staff I don't even remember the person's name. It's not about them. So, well, you know, we don't have college ministry here, to which I was like, <laughs> seriously? Yes, these kids, they are flighty. Uh, they move around from one church to the next, to the hottest, the hippest, to the whatever. So they don't give and they don't serve. So we don't even have a campus ministry here. We don't even invest in them. And I thought, <laughs> well, wow, that's, that's quite staggering. I remember walking out of that meeting and thinking, yeah, that's probably all of that's true to some degree, but have they been challenged to serve? Have they been inspired to give? And is there anything happening here that's so significant that there's no way they're going to leave here in three quarters or semesters and go to a church down the street because God is here and God is meeting them here and transforming them here and they're investing here and using their gifts here, not just showing up for a takeaway. And that just inspired something in me that just opened the vista of mm. the way I wanted to approach the generation. And it's a little bit self-serving, but I thought, well, you know, maybe they don't give, but they're all going somewhere. So whatever we invest in them, they are going to export whatever it is we invest mm -hmm. in them to business, to culture, to finance, to education, to America, to Europe, to Asia. They're taking whatever we invest in them, and they are going to go f at no cost to us <laughs> everywhere on the planet with it. It's a good investment. And I, I just wanted to value them and see what, what they would do. And they have risen to every challenge. Um, and then lastly, I think, you know, Carrie, another thing we had going for us, we saw them, we valued them, but our message was bigger than them. And this has been, to me, I think the um, kind of untapped 
rhythm of passion, if you will, is that we saw them and we valued them, but then we didn't cater to them. We actually called them to something that would swallow them up and totally overshadow their sense of self and draw them into something far greater, far grander than any dream they could have about their own identity, their own path, their own accomplishment, their own life. And so the message, die to yourself, live for the glory of God, find your true purpose and the ultimate meaning, which is God's glory. I think down deep, uh, every generation that we've served, and, and definitely Gen Z, they want that kind of a message. Well, I think that's a nice segue into another question I wanted to ask you, which is, do you have any insights into Gen, what what Gen Z church might emerge? I think we all agree. Like if you look back uh, when you were coming up, there was a model of church and you helped pioneer a new way of being church, right? And I wonder if we're in a period now, particularly over the last seven, eight, nine years, COVID notwithstanding, where we're in transition. What was the church is the style that we built in the early 2000s and maybe early 2010s is transitioning into something else. And I wonder if, and, and feel free to disagree or add your own comments, whether Asbury, and I know you were there, but what broke out at Asbury in February of 2023 was whether that was a little bit of a sneak peek into what we might expect in the future church. I just love any thoughts, musing, anything you've got in that department on what we might be seeing in the next generation and how they might shape the church. I think uh, having been at Asbury, um, mm -hmm. A, I'm a big, uh, I'm just grateful I was there. And I know there, are, I guess there are categories of uh, viewpoints on Asbury now. I don't really, I'm probably not the most up-to-date person on uh, what, what conversations are happening out amongst uh, people who would critique something like Asbury. But I, I don't think it was a revival necessarily, and I don't think Asbury ever called it revival. I think they were actually very careful not to call it revival. And um, what it was was hunger. It was mm. hunger. It mm. was hunger. And uh, I, we, this, uh, our conversation's not about Asbury, but I was there through the night on, uh, on this particular night that I was there. And I, the things I will remember about Asbury were somewhere around, I don't know, I can't remember the time. Let's just say it was 12.45 a.m. Uh, grandma and granddad coming in, 80, both of them. Mm. Uh, he had a cane, uh, she's on his arm, and they're just shuffling down the aisle to about 10 rows down, take their seats. They stay, I don't know, I don't watch them that carefully. They probably stay an hour and I leaned over to a friend of mine and I said, I've lived a long time and I've seen a lot of things happen in church before, in the church building before. I've never seen a senior adult couple shuffle into church at 12.45 a.m. on a weeknight. <laughs> never one time. Uh, an hour later, a dad came in with his 11 and 9-year-old sons. And they found their way down a few rows in front of the older couple and they sat down. And I said, well, you can mark that down as well. I'm 65 years old. I've been around church all my life. I have never seen on a school night a dad come into church at 1.30 in the morning with two elementary school age kids. Mm. They were hungry. Mm. They came. And maybe, I don't know what was going on outside, maybe the line was two hours long or three hours long. Maybe they got there at 10, and that's just, they had to wait that long to get in. Um, but yes, to answer your question, back to the question, I definitely think that was a sneak peek to a paradigm shift, and it is shifting paradigms. And everyone who's in a position like myself, who's leading anything, is processing that unless you weren't there or you're anti what happened there and you're just trying to write that off again, avoid it, or be antagonistic toward it. But if you're trying to understand it, mm -hmm. if you cared enough to actually go and be in it and try to immerse yourself in that moment and humble yourself into what God was stirring there, 
then you're processing with that. And so your next question is going to be, and what are some of the takeaways from your processing that? I think uh, just less polished um, Mm -hmm. and a little more rough around the edges and a little more what is God doing right now in this gathering and taking a chance, just taking a chance taking a step, maybe. um, And one of the things that uh, hasn't been said, I don't think very well as the story of Asbury has been told, is it probably was more about confession of sin than it was about singing songs all day and all night long. It it was about people standing up in front of people and confessing their sins and coming into the light. And I think that you know, that hasn't been the hallmark of most church gatherings for the last little season. And I think that it is a hallmark of the move of the Spirit of God. That is interesting. You know, I grew up in a mainline tradition, Presbyterian, so any Presbyterian background or people could could identify with this. But, I mean, the prayer of approach and confession was the first act of a fourfold pattern of worship. And I led a church that was in the non-denominational you know, evangelical mold. And I'm like, we, we lost that somewhere. We lost mm-hmm. that. And I'm not talking about, a, I'm, I'm not slamming liturgical. I'm not talking about bringing back a rote prayer of confession, but there was something really, really powerful about a prayer of approaching confession that I wonder if we've lost. Do you want to uh, muse a little bit more about what you just said about confession and its role in corporate worship? I think it... Um... You know, Carrie, when we uh, have come through like the last 20 years, particularly 25 years ago, I and I applaud it, honestly. I, I would never really, really a big proponent of seeker friendly church. I didn't really like the terminology personally, mm-hmm. um, but I wasn't anti people who were really passionate about that either, like a Willow Creek. Um, I respected that church. And the way they did things changed my life. The, their their commitment to uh, rising above average and being exceptional at presenting the gospel uh, was very, very inspiring to me. But I didn't like the language, uh, and I didn't, you know, I'm, I, I say it this way. Um, some people talk about the living room, and then they talk about the uh, maybe the, the the breakfast table, and mm-hmm. how you kind of bring people into the story, and I understand all that and get it all. But I think if you put me in that paradigm, I'm probably the kid in the basement who's playing the music too loud that the parents are opening the door and yelling <laughs> downstairs, "Hey, knock it off!" And so I'm like, where do I fit into this whole thing of the living room, kitchen table, you know, whatever? I'm kind of you can feel the floor thumping down there. Because I just wanted to invite people into the anthem of heaven and invite them into the power of the the Spirit, proclaiming the Word of God, um, because I believe that that's enough. It always has been enough, and I think it's enough right now. But I got a little sidetracked. But when this movement of, hey, let's make our doors a little wider and let's Mm. make this easier for the entire community to step in, I know, let's let's put a coffee shop in the lobby. <laughs> you know? yeah. I think that's right about where the uh, approach and confession probably started to fizzle out, because it's hard to have approach and confession in one hand with a latte in the other. And that's no knock on coffee shops. Mm-hmm. You know, God bless every, every church's coffee shop. It's just that you don't see many people coming into the presence of God in the story of Scripture with a, with a coffee in one hand. Our hands are made for worship. They're made for, for lifting. They're made for clapping. They're made for kneeling. They're not made for holding. <laughs> the, this is not one of the postures of worship, is holding. Um, and so how do we come with open hands and lifted hands and applauding hands, and prayerful hands, and prostrate hands with a, with a coffee cup in our hand. Mm. So our whole mentality has shifted and changed, and 
somehow we've got to get back to that simple uh, idea. It's more than just a simple little phrase that we've got to learn how to, I, I need to re- regain how to come worshiping to church, mm. not to come to church to worship. And there's a big, big difference. Not to, I think you, we've known each other long enough that you'll understand the heart behind this question, because I'm not trying to stir up a controversy or a headline or anything. But in, in the most sincere way, I can ask the question, because I agree with you. I'm surprised. How did, how did Asbury become uh, a subject of criticism or microanalysis or agenda bearing? What are the critics of something like Asbury missing? That's my question. Like if we if we just if if we're tempted to dismiss it or say oh that's not part of our tradition or whatever, what what do you miss in a moment like that? Because you were there, I followed it with great interest, but you were in the room. What what are we missing if we dismiss it? Well, I think uh, I don't know, Carrie. I think I, I want to be really careful how I approach yeah. this because I I'm not an expert on Asbury. I was there for for a night. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad I went. Um, yeah, I but you've seen, you've on, also seen God break out at passion conferences at your church. I mean, you've you've had a front row seat a few times to that yeah. stuff. Well, yeah, I, I think I'd like to maybe back up a step and just say why why be a critic of something like Asbury? Um, and I guess there are people who could explain that to me, and and I would go, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. But either. So e- either go, be positive, or just go and go home. But I don't understand why you would want to make a an argument against uh, something. And I I get all the how it grew, and um, you know you you and I both have been in many Asbury moments in life. Uh, I was we were in a moment in South Africa a few months ago. And we were in a rented theater on a college campus in Cape Town, but God was moving in such a profound way that we could still be in that room right now. I'm convinced of it. If we had just said, hey, we own the building and we're going to not end this uh, meeting right now, we could still be there. And Asbury could still be going if it wasn't absolutely <laughs> crippling Wilmore, Kentucky, yeah, and yeah. causing the entire county to come to a standstill and alerting FEMA and everybody else that was concerned about how to take care of a population of people that was growing so quickly in a very, very, very small town. Um, we've all been there. And I think that uh, what people are missing is just simply that... We don't want to rush past anything. We don't want to overhype anything. Um, I could call for a prayer meeting. I'm pretty sure now at Passion City Church tonight, and it could go all night. Mm. Uh, that's not hard to to facilitate, but I don't think that's what Asbury was. I really yeah. do believe it just was an opportunity for hunger to be met. And that's my takeaway. It's not mm. we need to do Asbury. It's not we need to have all night worship. It's not we need to do A, B, C, D, E, or F. My takeaway is people are hungry, and they're hungry to know I'm in in a, a move of God, not just in a church gathering. So, yeah, another question before we leave the subject of Asbury and and the move of the Spirit, because I'm very interested in that. Sometimes I think various things can get in the way. I mean, we all, a lot of us who listen to this use pro presenter and our services are timed to the minute that can get in the way. Uh, I already know what I'm going to say. I know exactly how I'm going to close that can get in the way. Although I don't think you should be unprepared when you speak. That's just me. Um, And sometimes our traditions, right? Like I have a liturgy or I have a thing. And, and that can get in the way, our stiffness or our, our, our adhesion to detail. What are, what are some things that, that prevent us in the church, perhaps, from going to where God might want us to go? Well, I, let me preface my, uh, my thoughts, uh, Carrie, by just saying, you know, being on time and being led of the Holy Spirit are not uh, mutually exclusive ideas. Here, here. Yeah. And I just think that we've got to tear that uh, false thought down, or right. we're going to criticize people who are on time, and we're going to applaud, oh, man, the Spirit was really moving. That thing went all night. It's like, well, God can move powerfully, supernaturally, in the Spirit, by the Spirit, 
and meetings can still end on time. That's mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes just good leadership. It's just good pastoring. It's just yeah. being able to know how to walk with the Holy Spirit and to know that it, there's no extra prize in heaven for going overtime. Um, the Holy Spirit is happy to function in, in time and in rhythm. God isn't a non-rhythmic God. He actually is on time and is very much about time. Mm. But at, at the same time, I think that you know, all the things you mentioned, uh, the schedule is a barrier. And when I came back from uh, Asbury to our church, I didn't call for all night prayer, thought about it. Uh, hmm. Seeing the hunger of that couple coming in at 2 a.m., I was like, I wonder who'll show up here if the doors are open all night. Yeah. Um, so we didn't call for all night prayer, but I did say publicly to our, to our church, I want this to be the year that we don't do business as usual. Mm. And we're, we're fighting for that still, and we're still contending for that. And uh, to hear my pastor say that, in the spirit of not doing business as usual, we did a response time like this. In the spirit of not doing business as usual, we added this moment. In the spirit of not doing business as usual, we called for this opportunity for people to respond. And it's just saying, yes, we're planned. You know, I've always said, and I know you've said the same thing, but the people who are most adept at following the Holy Spirit in spontaneity, in my mind, are the people who are most prepared. Preparation mm -hmm. allows you the freedom of spontaneity. And so, and I want to be that guy. I want to be prepared and spontaneous. I mean, I was at an event this weekend in a rodeo arena in Montana. And I had a message like right on a on a piece of paper in front of me, and it was nine minutes before I was going to give it. But I did not know that in the nine minutes, a young high school student was going to tell a story about spiraling into the darkness at the, the suicide death of his cousin mm. and how it was coming to this same conference two years before that God met him, pulled him out of that spiral, out of that darkness, and actually let him take a step of being baptized, and he was encouraging his fellow members, attenders at this gathering, you're going to have that opportunity to be baptized. Well, as soon as the words come out of his mouth, the Holy Spirit just pricks my heart. If that cousin took his life, I wonder how many young people are sitting in this gathering right now that already have a plan to take their life. And so my message shifted instantly, and... The psalmist's words came out first, I will live and not die, and I will declare what the Lord has done. And I said, if you're standing here, or if you're sitting in this gathering right now, and you already have a very clear plan to end your life, God's given you the opportunity to choose light and not dark, and we love you, and this is a place where you can stand and be cared for and valued, and I want to give you the chance to do that. Well, that was not in the plan. Mm. Wow. That was not the talk. It wasn't my message. That wasn't how I saw the next nine minutes going. But that definitely was the way the Holy Spirit saw the next nine minutes going. And what happened as a result of that was powerful and profound. And so I just think it's a mentality that we have to hold on to. The Asbury residual for me is I don't want to do business as usual. I want to see every gathering, every conversation, every happenstance meeting with somebody as an opportunity to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, to see the kingdom come in a moment to change people's lives and to bring glory to God. This may be an unanswerable question, and if so, we'll move on. But how do you know when to move off script like that? And how do you know on, you know, many other occasions, it's just like, I'll, I'll stick with what I prepared. It might be unanswerable. Yeah, it is, it is unanswerable. I think uh, I, I have asked the question. Yeah. And I want to lead my team better in that. You know, there have been a lot more instances in the in the recent past, say this year, last year, where I have felt a strong sense and sometimes a very clear urging from the Spirit of God. Uh, in in my mind, I'm interpreting it as a clear urging of God. Let me just put that footnote right there. I'm sensing it that way. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but that's what I'm sensing. Mm. And sometimes it is very specific. Uh, and I don't, you know, 
that's not my thing. I, I'm not uh, I'm not the guy that's going to lead the seminar to teach you how to have a word of knowledge. Um, mm. But God does put impressions, I think, in our lives. And I know for me, there, there's one specific one I was thinking about it the other day, because it's been a, a couple years now, but it's when we were primarily in an online mode and I was walking up to speak and I just had a flash, kind of like the picture I saw of passion in 1995, sitting on an airplane. I mean, and it turned out to pretty much be a picture of one day 2000. Wow. But I'm seeing it in 1995, and we've got four years of passion to get there, starting in 1997, 98, 99, and 2000. But same kind of thing. I'm walking up to preach, and I just see this guy watching our gathering um, at his computer. And the Lord just nudges, or I sense, I just, let me put all the qualifications Mm -hmm. in there. I just sense the Lord say, this guy needs to be encouraged about X. And he's uh, in this little town outside of, uh, I don't remember now, either Louisville or Lexington, Kentucky. And I can see the guy. Well, Carrie, what I'm going to do in that setting uh, is I'm going to try to back that down as far as I can. Um, I am not going to go, I have a heard from the Lord. I have a word from God. <laughs> I have a picture that, that I just got from heaven. I, so somewhere in the talk... I say, and you know, if by chance you're 20 minutes outside Lexington right now and you're joining our gathering, I just want to encourage you today. And I said the X. Well, I didn't say you. I didn't say what direction. I didn't say it was a guy. I didn't say anything. I'm just trying to say, I don't know, but I have a pretty strong feeling and I'm going to go for it. And um, sure enough, we get an email the next day from the guy. And he lives 21 minutes outside the town, southwest of the direction that I saw. And God really spoke to him, and he said, the X is this, and I know that God is with me, and I'm going to make this decision and not that decision. And for me, I, I'm not going to write a book about that. I don't, I'm kind of sad that I actually said it here. I'm not going to say edit it out, but I'm like, mm. uh, that's the kind of stuff you just go home. You don't tell people, you know, about that. But it, it's happening more. And I think mm. it is probably happening more because the tone of spiritual engagement has significantly changed in the last year. Yeah. And the way I say it is uh, when Paul said, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Well, the devil's not so schemy anymore. And um, I just think the climate is changing. And I think that God is engaging us at a level of inviting us in to the supernatural dimension. So I'm never leaving exegetical preaching I'm not leaving um, being prepared, but I also want to live in the supernatural. Don't we all want to live in the supernatural? And don't we want to know in the flow of a day that it's not just what we can see and touch, but that we're living in a kingdom that is supernatural all around us? And... I want to live in that. I want to preach in it. I want to open the Word of God in it. I want to minister to people in it, pray for people in it, engage people in it. And if that doesn't happen on a given day or for a month or a week, and you don't have a picture like that, or you never have a picture like that, great. That's awesome. Just preach Mm. the Word of God. Uh, That's what I want to do. But every now and then, God gives you that little nudge. And I knew that in this moment, uh, people, I don't know how people felt around me, but I'm 65 now, Carrie, so I'm not trying to be cool speaking at a youth conference. I'm not trying to put bruh, you know, in my talk everywhere, because that's the, the word that all the kids are saying now. Not bro, but bruh. Uh, I'm not trying to get bruh in all my talks. I'm not trying to drop rapper references in my messages. I'm not trying to convince people that I'm the coolest guy they've ever met because nobody's really looking for that out of a 65-year-old guy to start <laughs> yeah, with. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'm not afraid to walk into a rodeo arena and ask somebody who's got a specific plan. And I said, I'm not talking about you're depressed, you're sad, you've been in a low spot in life, you're, you're, you've got anxiety issues. I say, you have a plan to take your life. 
this is the person God is reaching for right now. I, and if not one person stood up, I wouldn't have been embarrassed. I wouldn't have felt awkward. I wouldn't have gone, well, that didn't work. I wouldn't have gone, oh my goodness, is nobody standing? Is everybody okay? I just am confident enough at 65 to fail and mm. to just take a step. And when the first, um, you know, middle school kid who's barely four feet tall stands up. Um, you know, you, you, you've learned in time, I think. Um, trust, trust that nudge. <laughs> hmm. Go with that. Because it's not like going out on some, you know, I'm not preaching a new gospel. I'm not writing a new book of the Bible. Yeah. I'm not, I don't have a revelation that I got, you know, in the, you know, I, I'm just offering an invitation to people to come around God's word. I will not die, but I will live and I will declare what the Lord has done. I'm really grateful I asked the unanswerable question. Um, you know, it reminds me, and it's a good heart check because I'm preaching again this fall. And there was a time where I was much more open to spontaneity. And it probably was inversely proportionate to preparedness. I've always prepared. I've never been a wing it guy, but I've probably become more prepared over the last decade. And I wonder if sometimes that's just a good check in my spirit to make sure I'm truly open because you don't know what God wants to do in that moment. Um, I don't think in all of our conversations, I don't think we ever talked about what happened on the plane in 1995. Do you mind sharing that story? <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, short story, you know, Shelly and I left a campus ministry in Texas, the one that I talked to the guy about meeting at his church about. Mm -hmm. Booming ministry. We were so thrilled to be serving college students every day. Was that in Waco? Uh, Waco, Texas, Baylor yeah. University, Choice Bible yeah. Study. Mm. Shout out to all the Choice people uh, out there listening. Just really amazing. You know, we didn't have a big plan. We didn't really know what we were doing. We had a one-year renewable contract with God every year for 10 years. It was such a great time of life. <laughs> but my dad had become disabled, and for seven years of the 10 years, my mom was taking care of my dad around the clock here in Atlanta. My dad instantly became disabled because of a brain virus, and my mom really needed help. And I'd been asking the Lord, Shelly and I had for seven years, if... Uh, he would release us to come help my mom take care of my dad. And finally, he did, very clearly and distinctly, in the fall of 1994. And so we announced to everyone at the spring semester, um, hey, this is going to be our last semester here. Come May, we're going to move to Atlanta. Um, we had our last Bible study on Monday night, May 1st. And 10-year um, celebration is a big night, uh, but we weren't there. Because uh, that night, uh, that day, May 1st, uh, we buried my dad here in Atlanta. Mm. He had a heart attack on uh, Friday, April 28th. And everything went haywire, you know, for us. We're like, well, we're now got no country. We got no people. We got no job. We can't go back at this point and undo, you know, a semester's worth of transitioning all the leadership. So we moved to Atlanta. No dad, uh, helping my mom kind of re-enter life, and um, I went to speak um, at a youth event at um, in Dallas, Texas, in June, um, at Reunion Arena, which no longer stands, but <laughs> used to be where the Dallas Mavericks played. And I was flying on a Delta flight, sitting by the window, about twenty rows back, reading Christianity Today magazine of all things. <laughs> Actually holding it in my hands. And as you recall, it had advertisements. The last six, eight, ten pages were mostly advertisements for Christian schools. Uh, so I'm kind of just flipping and looking. And on the page, Carrie, this is so crazy how this all happened, is an advertisement for the new Ocean Center. I don't remember the specifics. 100,000 square feet of convention space on the beach in Daytona Beach, Florida. Well, side note, just for another story for another day, that's just where we held Passion Camp for 6,500 middle and high school students a few weeks ago and have wow. for the last several years. And I've spoken in the Ocean Center every summer for probably the last 15 to 20 years. 
Absolutely. but it just was opening in 1995. And while I'm reading this advertisement, I just go away somewhere. I have no idea what happens. I am somewhere, and there are more college students than I can count or or really fathom, and they're on their faces on the ground praying and interceding for spiritual awakening in their generation. And I've seen, you know, our 1,500 students on Monday night at Baylor. I've spoken mm-hmm. to a few thousand-person college conferences around the country in the last, you know, 10 years while I've been doing this, but I've never seen anything like this before, and it just arrested me. And just like that, I'm looking back at that advertisement in the magazine, and I am so shaken up. I don't know what to do with what I just saw and experienced. Mm. It was a true vision. And I didn't, I got to Dallas, I spoke, got back on the plane, flew back home. I didn't talk to Shelly about it. The next day, the next day, the next day, the next day, maybe a week went by and I said, babe, I have to tell you about something and I told her, and Shelly has the gift of faith, and she she immediately kind of leaned into, I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't know what you saw, but obviously you saw something that we need to lean toward. And eventually a few days went by, I shared it with two mentors of mine that I had a lot of respect for, and they both immediately said, this is what God is doing, and this is what you need to be doing. And mm-hmm. in that moment, uh, passion was born. We didn't call it passion. I didn't know what passion was, when it would start, what it would look like, but I knew that's what God is calling us to move toward. And uh, within a year, the first passion gathering happened in Austin, Texas. There was 2,000 people there. 5,000 came back to Austin in 98. 11,000 packed out the arena in Fort Worth in 99. And then we knew we've got to roll the dice and we got to go for it. We got to find something outdoors. We got to find a hillside. This is the picture. We've got to, we need an awakening to happen right now. We can't wait for the incremental increase of two to five to 11. There are at that time 18 million college students in America, and most of them didn't know the Lord. And so we went for it one day, 2000 on a field outside Memphis, Tennessee, and it was 40 plus thousand college students on their faces on the ground, crying out for awakening in their generation. It was the picture that I saw on the plane and um, so much so that we didn't do passion the next year. We went, okay, that's it. That's what you call us to do. We're done. <laughs> and a year went by of not nothing. And then the Lord kind of gently said, and you know, there's a whole new group of freshmen coming in this year. Mm. You should keep going. And here we are a few months away from Mercedes-Benz Stadium and Passion 2024. Well, thank you for sharing that. You know, and 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 that that's going to be my takeaway so far, anyway, from this conversation is to be more open because, you know, this like rigid bullet point former Presbyterian lawyer, it was a supernatural thing. This is the reason why we're having this conversation. It really wow. was. It was a direct, and I, I look at it that way. I don't think God would have gotten my attention any other way, and it was confirmed. You know, because I have enough reformed in me, it was confirmed by the testimony of three or four mentors and witnesses, and over time, and I doubted it and the whole deal. But yeah, I, I definitely want to be more sensitive moving forward to the move of the Holy Spirit, rather than oh, I know the principles. I've read the book many, many times. I know what to do. Right? This, this is good. This is good. You mentioned your dad. And we talked about your dad before, but your most recent book um, really goes into it, to seeing God as a perfect father. And um, you talk about how your own relationship with your father, as much as you went to care for him at times, was maybe not what you had hoped it would be. Can you, I know we've talked about this before, but I'd love a little recap on the nature of your relationship with your dad, Louis. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, my dad's been gone, so that was 19... um... 95. So obviously some time has passed uh, since my dad's been gone. And Mm. I I honestly have great memories of my dad. My dad was an amazing father to my sister and me. The Mm. thing that was interesting about my relationship with my dad is that when he became disabled during those seven years, he had a few uh, additional brain surgeries complications. There was a lot of hospitalization, a lot of rehab, a lot of moments. And in one of those moments, um, 
I was trying to share the love of Jesus with my dad. My dad was a good Catholic. Mm. wasn't a good Catholic. My dad was Catholic <laughs> growing up. Okay. Uh, my dad really wasn't a good anything when it comes to denominations. Met my mom. My mom was a very good Baptist, and, and he was a nominal Catholic, so obviously our family became Baptist. And my dad went to the Baptist, Baptist church when I was a little kid. Um, but to be really honest, you know, once Charles Stanley started preaching the way he did every single Sunday, he came to our church when I was about seventh grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. Yeah, my dad wasn't sticking around for that. So <clears> he kind of dropped off the scene for for a bit. And that's when my heart caught on fire. You know, when I was a high school senior going into college, I, that's when the Lord called me to ministry. And my, my relationship with Jesus was white hot when mm. I was a freshman in college. Maybe as white hot as it's ever been, sadly. I don't know if that's good or bad. But, I mean, it just was—there was an intimacy that we had that it's hard to describe— and in the midst of that, the direction of my life got completely changed almost overnight, and the Lord just broke in with another one of those kind of row 20 moments, and it's like, you're going to preach the gospel to your generation. Well, I had to invite my dad into this process now, because it's Sunday mm. afternoon, and I'm going to go down the aisle at church tonight and tell the whole church that God's called me to preach. And uh, I haven't been able to find the words to, to tell my dad. So not fair to him. I walk into the kitchen in our little apartment where we lived, and my dad was warming up leftovers from lunch on the stove. And I said, Dad, um, I just need to tell you that tonight at the service, um, I want to tell the church that the Lord has called me to preach, and I'd love it if you would come. <laughs> that was a lot to get out, Kerry, uh -huh. in one sentence. My dad was never mean to me. He uh, was never abusive to my sister and me. He was the mm -hmm. kindest guy. But the look on his face said it all. Like, you got to be kidding me when I am playing golf with my buddies this weekend. And they say, hey, Lou, what's your kid going to do? I got to say, he's going to be a Baptist preacher. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, that all got a beautiful resolution. God was very gracious in that. And I talk about it in the book later on. But here, here we are. My dad's in the hospital. He's in the midst of this disability. He does not have a strong relationship with the Lord, and I'm trying to share Jesus with my dad, not, not necessarily to, for salvation so much as just to say, God is for you, God loves you, Dad, God is here, God is available, I love you, we love you. And my dad looked at me, Carrie, in the hospital across the room, and he said, he said, Ace, he said, nobody ever wanted me, and nobody ever loved me, and I don't believe God wants me. And I don't believe God loves me either. And I, uh, you talk about the bottom falling out. I was in my 30s, you know, and I'm hearing my dad now articulate what I've come to learn more about in the years since he died, that my dad was passed around from relative to relative, did not live with his mom and dad, um, went to three different high schools in his town because he was shuffled off to this family and then to that group of people to live and live with them for a minute. And my dad had lived his entire life without knowing the Father's blessing in his life. His dad died when I was like one years old. And uh, so he was. his dad was in his 40s, I think, when he died. And my dad had lived his whole life. Here he was in his 60s feeling like he was never wanted and never loved. And I mean, I didn't have a response to that. I, I, did, mm. I didn't have a—I could hardly get a sentence out. I mean, I did get a sentence out. I said, Dad, God loves you, and I love you. We love you. But you can't change 60 years of somebody's life story in a sentence. And I walked down the hall, and it's a, I talk a lot about it in this book. I walked down the hall, and I said, God, please let my dad live long enough that now that I have this revelation— and why didn't I get this sooner? Why didn't I see this sooner? Why didn't I get this earlier? I've got to now, because I've got enough blessing for, from you, for me and my dad. Mm. So I've got to start sending way more intentional blessing up the family tree than I have been doing. Mm. And I've got to see my dad as a son, not as a father. 
And that was a revelation for me. And I, I think it will be for a lot of people when they kind of step back from the pain, the hurt, the disappointment, the loss, I'm not minimizing any of that. And they just look through another lens and say, man, this, this person is a son who never had a father's blessing as much as he is a father who never gave me the father's blessing. And if you don't have a perfect heavenly father, you're kind of hosed at that point because yeah. he didn't get it and you didn't get it. But if you have a perfect heavenly father, you're blessed and your dad has a chance because you've got blessing for the both of you. Boy, that's such a strong and powerful word. Uh, one of the quotes you had really arrested me. I want to read it. It's from Dr. Peggy Drexler. Mm. And she noticed something I've seen in so many women I respect. And I want to get your thoughts. And this is the quote. In my research, Dr. Peggy Drexler, into the lives of some 75 high-achieving, clearly independent women, I knew that I would find a powerful connection between them and the first men in their lives. What surprised me was how deep and surprisingly traditional the bond is and how powerful it remains throughout their lives and how resilient it can be even when a father has caused it grievous harm. No matter how successful their careers, and this is the part that really captured me, how happy their marriage is, or how fulfilling their lives, women told me that their happiness passed through a filter of their father's reactions. Many told me that they tried to remove the filter and, much to their surprise, failed. We know that fathers play a key role in the development and choices of their daughters, but even for women whose fathers had been neglectful or abusive, I found a hunger for approval. They wanted a warm relationship with men who did not deserve any relationship at all. Close quotes. I have seen that so many times in my life, and I'd love your comments on it, Louis. It just, it just really, really gripped me. Um, what is it about the role of a father, and what is it about our just hungering for an approval? And somehow our accomplishments can't seem to make up for that. Yeah, uh, you know, that quote to me just arrested me just hearing you read it again. And it's not just yeah. true of women. You know, there's I also have a similar quote in the book about men. I think it is a yeah. human condition mm. that we obviously know that mothers are the reason why we are on the planet. <laughs> yeah. uh, it does take a, a father and a mother to create any one of us, but it is the mom who births us into life and and basically makes the world go round. And there's nothing, uh, I know for me and my mom, there, there's such a special bond in that that is irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. But that father voice coming into the story and saying, baby girl, mm -hmm. ace, that's what my dad called me, sweetheart, I love you, I am proud of you, I am so glad to be your dad, I want to show up, I'm willing to stick around, you mean the world to me, I would do anything for you. I believe in you. It's irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. And I the the options are we either admit it or you we we have a story that is either on one hand this this massive quest for accomplishment all the while under our breath saying I don't need it. I don't need my dad. I couldn't care less about my dad. I don't I hope I never speak to my dad again. To which I say, why do you keep telling me this? Why do you keep telling me that you don't want to be like your dad? Why do you keep repeating that you don't want to speak to your dad? Why are you repeating that you don't care if you ever see your dad? Or on the other hand, it's just this billboard of well after well after well after well after well. The Bible calls them cisterns that hold no water. We're digging in this one, digging in this relationship, this accomplishment, this success, this destructive behavior trying to find that sense of worth that comes to us powerfully by a father. And, and it, it's just echoed through the story and the narrative of God, so much so that he says, even if my, the, the psalmist said, even if my mother and my father forsake me, so if I get a double forsaking, the Lord will take me up. Another place, he's a father 
to the fatherless is the Lord in his holy habitation. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and among all the things he teaches us about God, he teaches us that he's a father. And yes, he's Lord, creator, sovereign, God, almighty, judge, ruler. But 189 times in the four Gospels alone, Jesus teaches us that he's Father. When you pray, this is how you pray, our Father. Why? Because he knows how we're wired, and he knows that we are hardwired for the Father's blessing. And it's powerful. Shelley's dad, uh, when he went to heaven a few months ago, um, she, the way she described it to people, she said, I'll, he was my person. And what she meant by that was, and she said this many times, she said, when I, I, my earliest memories of my dad were my dad telling me, you can do anything you want to do, and you can be anything you want to be. And she believed it, and it set a banner over her life, and she went, she went in that blessing into her life. And she will tell you right now, the most powerful thing outside of her relationship with God is the belief that her father had in her. And she had the gift of him telling her time and time and time and time again how proud he was of her. Hmm. What do you do if you don't have that in your life? Like God is your perfect father. I get it. But for the people who are listening to this or are married to people who, you know, had that story of not having the affirmation, what do you do? How do you access that? Well, I think this is, uh, is going to sound super simple, but this is the gospel. Yeah. Um, yeah. The gospel is you can have that. How? 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 Uh, by accessing Yahweh in a personal relationship through Jesus, whereby the result isn't that you become a member of something, the result of that faith journey in Yahweh through Jesus is that you become born again. Mm. This is no accident. You become born again. And then you are a child of God. So we're no longer slaves to fear, but we are the children of God. And now we have a relationship with a father. God has, is, hasn't chosen to reveal himself as he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in Christ, I now have a father. He's not the bigger version of my earthly dad. He's the perfect version of my earthly dad. And all the things I need from a father, I can access through him in a brand new relationship. And this is the miracle of our faith, that we are not worshiping some almighty being far off in the sky, but we are now in a personal intimate relationship with a God who calls us son, daughter, and who is going to be for us and give to us a better blessing even than the best earthly father, and is going to allow us to live in that blessing and carry that blessing to our children and the power of all power to reverse any curse over our lives and to even send that blessing back up broken family trees to our own fathers. This is the power of the gospel. Mm. Wow. I'm so glad we talked about that. Louis, uh, any final thoughts you want to share with us? Well, I just, it's been encouraging. Uh, I'm so glad we talked today because I I want to echo what you said uh, earlier about going back into preaching this fall. Um, obviously, you and I both are going to be prepared. Um, mm -hmm. You know, no, no one is going to stand and open God's Word and just say, I'll just wing it again this week. Yeah, I'll you know, swing it again. One more the, Sunday. The Lord will, yeah. will help me. Um, it's, a, it's a high calling, and yeah. I want to be ready for it. But I also just want to make sure, like you said, that I'm coming into every opportunity— and just saying, Lord, 
I have some ideas and plans and I actually have a, you know, maybe in your case, a manuscript or Mm -hmm. some very well-crafted thoughts and notes and direction and plan. But I want to be available in it, around it, before it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) after it, uh, a week out from it, in the planning meeting, in the pre-session prayer, as I'm walking up the stairs— my prayer, 99% of the time, and I have not prayed this every time I've spoken, but I have at least nine times out of ten my entire lifetime, Holy Spirit, fill me up. Gently overflow my cup. Touch my eyes and let me see me in you and you in me. Holy Spirit, speak. And I, I just want to... Mm lean into that again today um, as we share together, because I believe that's where, that's what separates a good message from a godly supernatural moment. Mm. Fantastic. Louis, as always, thank you so much. The book is out everywhere. It's called Seeing God as a Perfect Father. And connecting with you these days, Louis, where would you direct people? To social, to a website? Where's the easiest Yeah, place? anywhere. LouisGiglio.com kind of is a hub for most things. And uh, just so people know, right before we step away today, Carrie, this book mm. is a revised, uh, meaning I've touched almost every page of it, and it has some new chunks in it. Um version of a book that I released years ago that you and I talked about called Not Mm -hmm. Forsaken. And uh, this is the original title of those messages that I've been sharing all the way back to Choice Bible Study, Uh, Seeing God as a Perfect Father, shared them at 722, probably North Point when I spoke uh, as a guest speaker there some point in time, definitely preached to that Passion Conference, Passion City Church. It is a life message for me, and I wanted to give it one more chance. And so we're releasing it with its original title, a lot of fresh stuff in here as well. New opening, new ending. Uh, but just want to make sure people know that so somebody doesn't, you know, truck out there and hey, get wait the book a and go, yeah, wait, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. Those guys never mentioned to me that uh, I already had this book. Uh, you don't have this book because this one is new and updated, but this is the new and updated version of that But it's book. the way you feel it should be. Yes. There you go. That's always good as an author yeah. when, when you see it the way you want it to be. Louis, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Carrie. God bless.